you know, for want of a better word, is, is utilisation under control, that I'm keeping my staff not just busy, but they're actually engaged in the work that they want to be engaged in or they're doing the opportunity of the work that they're doing, so therefore their engagement will be high and guess what, their production will be higher because mm. of who they are and they're actually engaged in what they want to do. Yeah. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of the Success Times Happiness Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Thompson. Today, we have Alan Scott from Osmosis. Alan has spent decades with Deloitte's and now runs his private company, helping other businesses become better versions of themselves as a business, as well as an individual. He has a wealth of experience, been highly recommended to me to sit down in the studio. and I can't wait to get into this and I hope you really enjoy it. So... Here we go. Alan Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. How would you define what you do, Alan? Generally, what I say is that I help other organizations or people get to where they want to be. And whether that's helping them be successful, helping them think about who they are and what they are and where they want to be, uh, it's uh, that's probably the way that I would describe it. Um, I have a number of ways of thinking or toolkits in my back pocket. I don't ever believe I know exactly which one works, but then working with organisations to understand, or individuals, understand where they want to be, uh, then applying whatever I can do to help them. But what I can see, and I've been, I've been highly recommended to speak to you and to be able to pick your brain today, which I really appreciate the opportunity to do. Uh, and you've helped so many businesses and people in business, I guess, to achieve that. My question to start off with is, how do you define success then? And how do you define happiness? Let me define happiness first. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose happiness for me is being comfortable in what you do, stretching yourself a little bit, but feeling like the moments and the times that you spend with either yourself, families or people around you are engaging, contented, providing the environment that they want to live in, they want to be in, and recognising that there's still growth, there's still somewhere that they've got to go is what I'd say happiness is. And I suppose I start there because success is achieving that and getting there. Uh, and uh, not necessarily monetarily, it's not necessarily material. Mm. Uh, it's understanding who you are, where you want to be, and success is knowing that to start with and then getting to where you want to be. So it's about, you think it's a balance between being really content with where you are now, as well as being driven to achieve something in the future. Cause I sort of feel like there's that, it's almost like a, a paradox between one line of thinking going, you've got to stay in the moment. You've got to, or you've got to be satisfied with what you have now and be um, somewhat agreeable to the condition you're in versus you shouldn't be satisfied with yep. with where you are now because you can always improve and you, can, you should always find that mountain to go and climb. How do you balance those two different ideas? I think the, 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 the thing that's in the middle of that for me is that you can get to a point and achieve what you've got and be contented with that. Mm. But the real essence is redefining or reframing what's next. So you can either stay on a, a, a continual path to get better at what you're doing or you can sort of say, I got to this point, now what's next? And let's redefine what's next and take some time to do that. And if I may, I, I mean, I was incredibly fortunate when I was back in my corporate days mm. being part of an acquisition where you know, Steve Sachs was a – was the, we bought Steve and Scotty Bozak's business and – uh, it was amazing. Steve then became a millionaire by the time he was 39. And Steve then, in a conversation, I can always remember it, saying, you know, I got to where I wanted to be by and a year earlier than I wanted. He wanted to be a millionaire by the time he was 40. 40, right. And his question was, then, what do I do now? <laughs> and that, for me, was a real reflection of contentment to a certain degree, if that's the right word, is I got to where I wanted to be by 40. Mm. But that didn't mean whether that was enough or not, was now there's an opportunity of doing something else, an opportunity of defining something else. So there's still growth, there's still 
stretch, if you like, but I'm always bundled that together and saying, well, that's a foundation of what I've achieved and now let's look at something else. Hmm. And um, I suppose the, the coming back to the original question about what's happiness or success is success can very much getting to an outcome and getting to a point where you want. And you can either be happy with that and not so much live with it, but not 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 do not do anything else. But you know, if you've got an ultimate goal of actually becoming a part, you know, in if I lose Steve as an example, a millionaire at forty, mm. I don't think it necessarily means that the next thing I've got to do has got to be better, or it's got to be a stro- further stretch. It's just the next thing, and as long as I'm doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, hopefully, you think that you're actually growing all the time. Mm. Is is what I'd be thinking. Yeah, I guess it's the growth. Right, like the the desire or the intent to keep growing yep. as a human yep. as we progress is the important part. Yeah, and it is. And I think, the again, coming back to what is success, success for me is being comfortable in defining what your growth is as opposed to having to respond to what someone's telling you growth should be. Mm. So you're, you, know, you take on board that influence, you take on board that information, but the definition of where you want to be is something you own and something that you achieve as opposed to trying to do it just because someone else says you can. Is that a process that you take your clients through in the sense of trying to extricate yourself from the external Mm -hmm. pressure or the external expectation and come back to self? Uh, I probably haven't thought about it in that terms, but the short answer would be yes. By virtue of what I do. The process, yeah. And, you know, two things that come to mind is that one of the obvious, sorry, one of the more frequent conversations we have is when we look at strategy of business, and in particularly, you know, if I if I may, you're about to you know launch your own. So, <laughs> if you look two years down the track and you sort of say, well, you know, what's next for you? And a lot of businesses pursue top line growth, revenue, mm-hmm. and you might say, well, you know, if you were going to be twice the size you are now and put all this effort in, but actually the bottom line doesn't grow so much. Mm. Why? Why do you do that? And so it's really challenging them what the true outcome is that they want to generate and is it staying the same size but doing it better, for example? Mm. Or, yes, there is a real objective to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The flip side of that for me or flip side is the other, other way of looking at it is what I get when I'm very, very fortunate to get involved in a lot is the conversations where business owners, and I have a passion for business ownership, they get to a point, and literally this is so topical at the moment because I'm about to go to Byron on Saturday to actually run a session with a very close friend um, who's had uh, two health scares recently mm-hmm. without sort of giving too much away and has grown a very successful business, but he woke up after that and said, why am I here? Mm. The passion that I have, that I had, that I did have for the business it's not the same. And that's not something he realised was happening. There's, there's, back to your point, this externality of things that are happening around him has given him a frame, I suppose, mm. to sort of relook at something differently. So I'm sure if I asked, you know, no names, um, you know, what success was for him, you know, five, six years ago compared to what now hopefully we're going to start to define on Saturday, what success might be. It's more about the holistic, I have a partner, I have kids, I have a life, I have a lifestyle, I have, um, you know, a reason for being of which hopefully the business then starts to support as mm. opposed to the business driving it. Yeah, right. And I, you know, I call that an owner's map, but it's, a, it's amazing the number of times that I get the opportunity of sitting in front of business owners that I'm working with and challenge them as to why they're in business. Mm. And, you know, they quite often s- stop and think, oh, Okay, that's an interesting question. Most of the outcomes of that, the bottom line always is the business impact. It's not driving it. And whether it's they start with their interests and passions or theirs and their partners or theirs and the families, it unpacks why they do what they do. And in some cases that has changed completely Mm. uh, or get out of business or whatever. So again, again, coming back to the beautiful question up front about success, success for them is actually the realisation of all of that, the realisation of why they're doing something and then having the opportunity and the availability to actually change the direction around it. And whether that's staying within the business, whether it's handing the business off, whether it's selling the business, whether it's diversification, diversifying into other areas. Um, but it's all about understanding why. 
I think you'd get it'd be pretty common where you would go into business with a fair understanding of what your values are and why you're doing it and you're motivated and not necessarily motivated, but you're driven to do something. Yep. And that's that's why you commence. But then as humans, right, it's so normal for us to evolve, obviously, and change and develop different priorities in life and you get a health scare in there and it certainly brings reality to you. Yep. So it's probably not uncommon where you get to a certain point of business and you you ask those questions of like why why are you in business and it hits them like a truck yep. because they don't – it's been a long time since that they've had those thoughts or those – they've reflected on it and maybe now at that period of time where the business is and where they are is there's, there's, a, there's a bit of – Bit of distance between the two. Yeah, there are, and quite often in the in the times I've had the chance to do it, there's been a trigger. Now, whether it's a health scare, sure. whether it's a the failure of a business, or whether it's the opportunity that they've got to do something they've never thought they could do, and oh, if I, you know, I now have to balance whether I can do that, but who's going to look after the business or whatever. And you know, if I could wave the magic wand with most business owners, I'd be getting them to have this conversation right at the front, or, or before, yeah, before the triggers, right? before the triggers. Yeah. Um, now, whether that changes what they do or whatever, I'm not sure. But it's in most cases, it's all coming out of a trigger, mm. and sort of says, okay, well, I hadn't, unless, and it's almost like, um, you know, to a certain degree, a flashing light. But uh, if this trigger didn't happen, I would never be asking you to do this and having having this comment. So there's a silver lining around sure. that. Uh, but, yeah, normally it's a trigger that sort of prompts it. How would do you advise people in business separate their personal and their professional lives? What's what's that process look like? There's a couple of little techniques that it's – it's. I suppose I'm not saying it's rocket science, but one technique I've, I've suggested because I used to do it myself. And it comes to not bringing work home and you allow yourself the time to sit on the front step before you walk through the front door and – whatever's in your head or whoever you've got to talk to or whoever you've got to ring. And that could be a 10-minute exercise. It could be a two-hour exercise. Getting into the habit or allowing yourself to know that as soon as I walk across that threshold, it's family time or it's personal time or it's partner time or whatever. So I think there's a, a real strong opportunity of, of a little little techniques. The other one, I mean, I'm, again, fairly fortunate, lovely fortunate that I have a border collie. And you know, into the habit of, again, before I walked into that house, if I'm sort of upset, whatever, go to the backyard, throw a ball and play with the border collie. Mm. It just resets you. Because mm. um, the beautiful thing about dogs and a lot of animals is that not, they don't care what they happened. They don't care. They don't care. Yeah, it's the same with kids. Yeah. 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 So, you know, they, they are the first two things that come to mind. Mm. Um, I'm a big believer in walking in... You know, during the day, if you're having meetings, have some meetings walking, have some meetings walking and talking. And whether that's um, regrounding or grounding people or whether it's taking them out of the the work environment so they're thinking a little bit differently. Uh, and if you're out there doing that and walking amongst, you know, the trees, the birds or whatever, you, you don't always do it, but you have the opportunity of actually remembering that the four walls that you're in within your office, within your... Mm warehouse there's more to it god i'd love that to be socially acceptable though yeah to be able to have a client come in the door and there's a matter that they want to talk to you about and yep. you say let's go for a 45 minute walk <laughs> that would be brilliant i'd love that but I, I think they'd look a bit they'd look at you a little bit well the challenge that i have with that is it depends on how you're portraying yourself because if you're a business that actually has those values be upfront about it yeah uh, because that will differentiate you if i come purely back to a business outcome sure. That will differentiate you. <laughs> and and you know, quite, quite so much in business for me is about what you actually provide your clients. You also provide your staff. And, you know, if you're demonstrating that that value or that, you know, you want that to be acceptable, you take your staff for walks. Mm. You know, go and have those conversations because hopefully as you demonstrate that as a leader in the business, as they progress, they will then see the benefit of doing that and they'll do it. You almost have it, you know, by osmosis that this starts to become – the norm for a business as mm. opposed to, oh, he's different. Mm. Why is he doing that or he or she? Why, why are they doing that? Um, well, you said osmosis and your your business is asmosis. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually almost stopped myself saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love today for a little bit of a masterclass, if you wouldn't mind, to be able to take us through what or give some some 
helping hints or, or ways that people in business and I guess it applies to employees as well, right, in the sense of how they can be better at work yeah. generally. But, you know, from from goal setting to setting up structures or setting up processes to achieve those goals and like what you need to do to achieve what you've set out to do. Yeah. To for you to be able to, I don't know, give us a an insight into your brain and how you deal with your clients um, from 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 ground zero. Yeah. And I saw I know that you're a huge advocate I guess from this whole process from listen, but with listening. Oh, that's exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. Yeah. So Listening uh, to understand rather than to hear, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is the, in my opinion, it is probably one of the most underrated skills um, and also one of the most valuable skills that anybody in business who wants to not only engage with staff but with clients, uh, the opportunity is for them to master it or at least to get better. And... You know, of all the things that you can do in business, if you actually truly listen, and if you truly listen, you don't jump to conclusions. You actually take the time to absorb it. And one of the other catch cries that we talk about quite often is dangerous assumptions. Because if you connect the two of those for me, is if you don't, if you're not um, where you could be on listening and you then jump, you generally jump based on some assumption that you haven't confirmed or something, assumption that might be a little bit dangerous. Um, but I think if you can listen, um, you slow you you slow yourself down because you are focused on listening. Uh, you almost wait to the end before you actually jump. And I think the way that we are made up as humans, we try and f- find an opportunity early in a conversation to find relevance f- for the, yourself in. The other person. So what I mean by that, and the best way I can give you an example, is you know I was at a um, an expo on on uh, chemical free goods and the, and there was a gentleman, great guy called Peter, but um, selling magnesium products. Right. And wonderfully, I've got four children, so wonderfully we we hadn't seen each other for a while, and he actually asked me about my kids. And the way I suppose my logical brain works, I started with my eldest son Ben. Mm. And I suppose the opportunity, whether it was me or not, but the opportunity for Peter was to listen to all my four kids. Never got to kid two, three or four. Because part of what I was explaining about what Ben was up about, he found relevance. He then found something that his children had done and then it suddenly became about his family. Him. Yeah, and it it was done in a nice way or whatever. But for me, that's probably the example where we as humans try and find relevance in a story, relevance in a sharing that probably in the nicest sort of sense tries to convey to the other person that I'm listening and I'm really on board with you. But what generally happens is it then takes it off into a tangent. And again, with listening, I I quite often say ask for permission. So if we were talking like this and, um, you know, talk about sport backgrounds or whatever, I'd be saying, well, may I share something? And, and, you know, 99, 999 <laughs> times out of a 1,000, someone's going to say yes. Mm. But it tricks, it, it reminds me that I am asking to a, put you're some. In, you're inviting. I'm inviting. I'm, put, I'm asking to put something into the conversation. I'm not taking it over. Mm. Because you might then say, well, you know, I'd love to hear it, but can I just spend. Can I finish my story? <laughs> can I finish my story? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's listening. It's asking for permission. It's res- and, th- and that, again, all in business just becomes beautifully respectful. And that happens for me both understanding what your clients or customers are looking for, take the time to understand that, and certainly understanding what your management or your staff are looking for, take time to understand that. And, you know, the classic count to five, you know, I still think I'm a, I'm a big fan of that where don't jump, count to five and let it absorb. So, um, you know, one of the greatest techniques or greatest tips I can give anybody running a business is learn how to listen. And be prepared to be picked up when you don't, mm. and you know don't take that as a, that don't take that offensively. Take it as the greatest gift you can get, because someone's reminded you that you're making it about yourself or you're not listening. And I, I don't think there's a lot of people. I don't. I think there's an opportunity to do that and differentiate yourself in business. Is is fundamental. 
I'll take a leaf out of your book and <laughs> invite myself to add a story to that. Please do. Um, I found in in this studio, in this space, as a host of a podcast, I find I am struck in a balance between being present and actively involved in a conversation. I feel like I've, I've taken a couple of notes in preparation for this, but not much because yep. I felt like I, I believe I can hold my own court in the topic and I'm intrigued to know what your thoughts are and I'm happy to play along, not really knowing exactly where it's headed. I've got a few ideas in my mind, but I'm trying my best to be present to listen and to then try to think whether I can clarify. And a few episodes ago, I had a, <clears throat> an expert on a topic that I had no idea about or well, yep. very little about and she was esteemed and I had the greatest and she's been interviewed heaps and heaps of times so I was trying to differentiate myself and didn't want to feel like I look like I'm a fool and had these beautifully crafted questions and the way that I wanted the conversation to go but I wasn't listening yep. you know if I'm being honest with myself yep. and Cody who's the producer he was like that's a good episode but you need to you need to let go. <laughs> you need to be able to just flow, right, with it and just as you usually do. But it was very different for me because I was like, oh, I better really get some good questions up. And so I'd ask a great question and not really be part of that conversation. It was almost like a, I don't know, it just died, the answer, you know yeah. what I mean? And so on reflection, I've been able to say, okay, I need to be more present. I need to listen. Yep. Yeah listen to understand, not just to hear. Yeah. So, and you, as you said, Alan, like that's for people in business and I guess relationships as well, right? Mm. And family and everything we do is to be able to, it's not just the customers or the clients, it's the, it's the staff, it's the suppliers, it's everyone in business that we're involved with. It's the ability to, to really pay attention. It is. And I think what occurred to me with that share, so thank you for that, is if we're both listening, what a great opportunity to take a conversation somewhere that neither of us thought it would. And agendas are good. I'm not, I'm not against agendas because that's always a backbone to come back to or agendas or, you know, structure or whatever. But quite often they can dictate too much where an outcome is expected to end up. Mm. Whereas if you've got two people who are willing just to explore um, with respect but without necessarily overstructure, where that sort of conversation or, you know, classically if you come back to business, you know, what's the true question we're trying to solve as opposed to particularly if you're in engaging with customers or staff, that you go into a, a, some of those interactions with an understanding, with an assumption of what the question actually is. But there's, a, there's a, a bigger question or a different question or whatever. But if you go into it too hardly with an understanding that you think you've got the question nailed mm. without exploring and listening – that, oh, hang on, I'm picking something else up here that I thought it was, you know, a supply issue. Mm. But really it's, you know, whatever, an engagement issue with your staff about how they choose to actually talk to a supplier. I'm playing. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but being open to whatever that conversation is about and understanding a little bit better about what the true question is that needs to be resolved. Generally, if you're answering the right qu answering the true question, all the questions that you thought were important get answered anyway mm. because that's the real – That's the truth. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> I'm not saying that doesn't come up if you don't listen, but I think there's such a greater opportunity for that to actually be unveiled, if you mm. like, by the willingness to not have an assumption, the willingness not to – um, need to sort of jump in and make it about each other. It's about what's the possibility. So you take the the business or the, the client through these paces. The first one, I guess, or very early on is what are we trying to achieve here? Yeah. Do you go down that path of does, how does it align to your own values? Do you under, do you go down that path of saying, is it very clear for others, for, for people to say, and is it as, is it as objective as I want to sell a million widgets? Yeah, it's it's the this is the number I'm trying. It's your it's your example of I want to be a millionaire by forty. Yeah, is are there those or do you go deeper and go? Well, why is that? I hate to give you a depends answer. It depends on the person who's talking because if if um, someone is absolutely there's been a lot of work in the last eight to ten years about more the purpose of a business as opposed to simply the mission or the why. Mm. Simon Sinek, you know, sure. it's always about why. 
but we, we run the risk of actually going too far down that path and if someone comes back with an answer, is I just want to generate $10 million in business. <laughs> and they sort of go, yeah, but why? Why is it? Why is do it? you want to do it? Yeah. I said, I just want to generate $10 million in uh-huh. business. So, you know, taking the time to understand the person and understand what drives them, that could be a perfect outcome. Because so it's that's okay. What, it's okay. It's okay for it's it to okay. be that that objective. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, it's okay for it to be that objective, but the follow-up question might be, when you get there, what are you going to do with the 10 mil? Mm. What are you going to do with it? Mm. So there's there's a couple of angles that you can bring that sort of question to or that sort of topic to. Um, or they can say, and I'm, again, having this great opportunity at the moment with someone who's been through a very commercial orientated business and now looking at putting in place a model um, where profit from the businesses that they generate goes to not-for-profit. Right. And um, his total, the altruistic person that's probably been deeper inside him is now out, mm. you know, and he's, he's still doing, it's, a, it's actually a beautiful story, he's still doing what he used to do in the industries that he's doing. I'm not trying not to give too much away here. Um, but previously I used to do it purely for commercial, mm. but now I realise I can use, I can do the same sort of thing, but for a completely different outcome that fulfils him further and takes him further. Um, but it's exactly this. It is, it's a fascinating. It's exactly the same business, same process, same process, same technique, same outcome. Yeah. But totally done for a different reason. Uh-huh. What and what a revelation journey, whatever that he's been through, um, to be able to get to that. So I guess in that instance, the underlying, the common denominator there is as long as it rings true to your purpose, or I guess as long as it, for another example, as long as it fills your bucket. Yeah. No matter how whatever you. However, which way you want to define your purpose, as long as it fills your bucket. Yeah. And if, for that example, if the person who wants ten million dollars, if that if that goal drives that person and fills his bucket to get to that point, then wonderful. Yep. He'll have to reassess to go. Well, what am I doing now? Once I get there. Yeah. But so don't we all? We do. Unless we have an altruistic, I guess, in perpetuity goal where it's just like I want to be better than I was yesterday. Yep. Then at some point we're going to get to the top of the mountain. We're going to achieve that goal and then we've got to reassess to figure out where the bigger mountain is. Yep. Or maybe not the bigger mountain, but a mountain worthy enough of climbing yep. no matter what the size. So I like your point. I like the idea mm. that... The other thing that comes up for me in my, in purely my opinion, someone who's always chasing perfection won't ever find it because if they're purely chasing perfection, they will always think there's other perfections. <clears throat> They'll always continue to find that perfection. Mm. Um, that's not saying that's not a... Um, a good goal or whatever, but if, if perfection's the outcome, I can imagine it's, it's going to be hard to actually ever get it because you might rethink, well, this can't be perfection. What's next? Mm. Um, but I mean, your your similarity there of or your visual of, you know, I climb this mountain, then I climb this mountain, then I climb me- this mountain. All those mountains might be exactly the same height. Sure. It might be the same complexity, mm. but they're different. Mm. So therefore that's engaging. And I think that's part of the opportunity that's available to sort of redefine and refocus and reframe what some of those opportunities are and bring people along with you. The other thing that occurred to me is is there's another word there that I, I believe in very, very much, which is congruency. Be whoever you want to be or present the business as it is truly is. And not saying you do this, but if you're a hard ass and you'll hold people over the coals and you'll set them very high standards and half the people won't achieve it. If on your website you say, we're a hard-ass business, we have high expectations and this is what we think you should be doing. Just own own that. Own it. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to, well, you know, where f- our website says we're fluffy and, <laughs> and you know, we, yeah. we give away most to charity and you don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, congruency for me is very important as well. And I think if you if you don't do that, it stands out very quickly. Yeah, if it you're does. if you're not aligned with who you truly are as a person or a business to what your front of office looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that point, I mean, I've mentioned it before on the show about the value of the climb of those mountains themselves. Doesn't have to. I agree with you, and I guess this is another layer of addition to that whole analogy that we've come off across today. That the next one doesn't need to be bigger. Yeah, it is different, but this whole position of I'll be happy when I achieve it. Yep. I think is a bit of a bit false because yep. you 
the, the, the real winner is the person that enjoys the climb, right? Yeah. And uh, one of, I suppose one of the other hobby horses I look at is process and content. And I think in business or in personality, um, most of the challenges that we come across, it's not about the content. It's about the process. It's about how we do things. It's about, and, and to your point, if I'm climbing this mountain, then I'm climbing this mountain. The fact that I got to the top is an outcome. But how I did it and what was my learning through that process and did I take someone with me or, you know, was it, um, you know, which will just come to mind, it's, you know, the west coast of New Zealand, which is incredibly vegetative, but the, the east coast of New Zealand, which isn't. So there's a wonderful difference between those two things, same country. Mm. But, and I've, you know, if the outcome is I get to the east coast or I get to the west coast, that's the outcome. But it's the, it's the journey, it's the, you know, journey overused word, but the, the process that we go through, which is the more learning than just getting to an outcome. Mm. And you know, a long time ago, I did uh, some business model canvas stuff with a lot of designers and probably half of them got really caught up with, I produce this, this is, this is what I produce. And, you know, suddenly taking them through discussion, saying, well, whether that's white, green, red, whatever, and, and value add to your client, to your customer, yes, they want that. But the real value add is how they got there and how you keep them engaged yeah. and how they get there. So for me, I try with businesses to really sort of get them to think about the process. Now, whether that's staff engagement, whether that's producing something for a client, whether that's, you know, reporting to a board, you know, the report, a board can read a document and three board members can read it totally differently. Mm. But it's how do you inform them? How do you get them engaged in that report? How do you actually get them along for what's achieved, what's been achieved in the last month or so? So don't underestimate the process of anything that you're doing because I do truly believe that the majority of learning is in the process, mm. not necessarily just producing the outcome. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think the majority, I agree with you, and the majority of the value of of the experience in its entirety is is tied up in the process. Yep. And I read a quote by Alex Hermosi recently that said, the grind is the goal. Mm. Cool. That's yeah, it. Love right? it. That's it. Yep. That's the goal. Yep. The meat and gravy is is the day in, day out. Yep. And I think that's beautiful, right? Yeah. And but I also like the you know, like the, the way that you just described the value of the process, but not not in the way of achieving. Yeah. But in the way of a particular element of your business, the way you look at that. Yeah. Which I think is, I've, I've, that just struck a real big light bulb in my head in the sense that, uh, as your example, I mean, you mentioned the board, but I like, let's look at it as a customer. The customer, let's say, comes and rings your, rings the office to be engaged, or let's say, comes in for their first meeting. There's a, a lot of things that have happened yep. in the lead up to that. Yep. For that client to have seen some sort of marketing or advertising or word of mouth referral to look at what services your business provides to be able to call and what that call initial experience was calling them. Yep. The follow up to that and all of those things that that's the whole process that comes to that needs to be that journey needs to go on that client needs to go on potential client or customer needs to go on before they go, yes, I'll yep. give you my work and yep. the outcome will take care of itself, like in all of those these things, right? Yeah, it is. And uh, what occurs to me, thank you for that, is I quite often have said it now in the last five or six years, the greatest tool, and I, I mean by a long way, to, to your question before about advice for business, the greatest tool that's ever been produced uh, is a thing called the empathy model. And to pay homage where it came from or where I believe it came from, it comes out of a book called Game Storming. Uh, but it literally is, and it's a page, um, where you have, whether it's your, the way it was set up was from your customer. What are they um, thinking? What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they saying? What are they feeling? In, in either general terms or as part of a particular outcome. Mm. So if you're thinking about the, you know, the, wars around the world at the moment and you want to actually help something, uh, your customer with something, you, cut, you, th you basically put the empathy model in front of them, in front of you, and challenge yourself to get inside their head and think about, you know, what are they feeling, what are they seeing, what are they saying, what are they hearing, what are they 
thinking, whatever, what I'm missing. Um, but out of that, particularly from a business perspective, what's there for the pain that they actually have? What's the gain that you could possibly take them based on that? And what's their expectation? And if you're sitting them in front of you, if you're sitting in front of them, what's their expectation on you? And what I've, and I honestly do believe it's one of the best tools that ever have been produced, if not the best. Because what quite often what I say to my business or my, my people that I'm fortunate to work with is do that for your customers or do it for your staff. Mm-hmm. And we did this uh, a long time ago with a, um, a group of builders because my client was a software provider into the building space. And they could do the customer. It was, fascin- it was fascinating. They could do the customer and happily use the empathy model and talk about their customers. We then switched it and said, okay, change it from customer empathy to employee empathy. And they were dumbfounded. <laughs> They, you know, they're almost looking at this blank piece of paper and saying, oh, what do you mean? Look at the staff. <laughs> and, you know, most businesses at some point in time go through performance reviews, go through whatever. Yeah. And, you know, what, what I'm saying is five or ten minutes before that performance review, fill this out. So if I'm doing it for Richard and saying, okay, well, where's Richard at? You know, right, I'm about to go and have a conversation about his performance. So what is he thinking? What is he feeling? What is he seeing? What is he saying? Mm. And in the business sense or even in life sense, are there certain pains that I could appreciate? If I'm using you as an example, Richard's got at the moment, are there certain things that as a business we can really put in front of him that he'll get some real utility from and great gains from? And if I'm about to sit there in front of him as a manager or leader or a boss, what's his expectation on me? Mm. And there's a certain vulnerability around that for, for owners or for managers to do that because it could be a very uncomfortable point where you sit there and you try and fill that form out and it only takes five minutes once you get to know the form. I don't know. Yeah. But what a great opportunity to then craft that into a question, whoever you're engaging with, and be almost vulnerable enough to saying, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I was sitting here thinking about, and what, you know, yeah. I don't know how you're feeling at the moment about where you are in the business, or I don't know how you're feeling about the change in the economic circumstances that you're now dealing with. Mm. And I would love to understand that. Mm. So I really, truly believe this one sheet of paper, this empathy model, is just such a powerful piece of paper that, you know, you know jokingly, you know, I, th- I think it's changed. Jokingly, when you say you're in, you know, five minutes in the back of the cab going to a meeting and you haven't even thought about it, what a great way of actually just shifting it from you. And I think that one of the best things about the empathy model, it shifts, shifts it from you because mm. it forces you to think about somebody else and, and forces you to think about the person that you're about to go and talk to. Mm. So instinctively it starts to put you in their world, not necessarily what you're selling or what you've got to give. Because if you can do that, I do, I do think you differentiate that conversation and I think it's a wonderful tool. I love that. And I, I, th- I think that because you brought it back to the, the five senses, right, mm-hmm. in both as customers and to employees, and I think no matter what your business is, and I, I've done a little bit of corporate speaking in the past, and my, I, I love this point about the fact that you, you speak to leadership teams or management teams, you know, what business are you in? And it's, oh, we sell cars or, you know, we sell widgets or yep. <clears throat> we're a law firm. And it's like, well, no, they're all the same because you're all in the people business Yeah. because that's all you've got to deal with. It's the people who work for you and it's the people that are customers of you and therefore you've got to understand how to deal with the people. Yep. And that's that's ultimately where you, you get to. And I gave this the example that like the, the new Microsoft CEO that took over, I think he took over Bill Gates, Satina Dalla. Yeah. He... You know, I think he had 15,000 or 20,000 employees and he took over and was very quickly to say, we're not a product business, we're not a software business, we're a people business. Yeah. And then the share price at that point, since his standing was like tripled as a yep. result of from that, you know, there's obviously a thousand different uh, things that have contributed to the share price increase. But it's leadership like that, right? Yeah. And I think that permeates through the business, both as in the employees that look up to you and the, st- and, the, and the customers, the clients that come through to know that you're that empathetic yep. and you're that, you're, you're that aware of your people. Yep. When you're helping your clients, Alan, how much of it does it come to the leadership? Oh, a lot. I'm, I'm 
And what do you do? How can we? <laughs> how can I'm we be better myself, leaders? Say one hundred percent. How can we? Better, how can we be better leaders? Or like, how do you? If you've got someone who's like, oh, I need your help because of X, Y, Z, and yeah. how? What? How do you get around? Or how do you work with someone to be a better leader? Yep. Because and and I'll, before you jump in on that, I think also leadership is. I mean, it is from it is top down, but I think also everyone can be a leader whether it's the person answering the phones, whether it's the cleaner, whether it's the MD, whether it's anyone, everyone yep. can, can act the same way. And, and, and that's a beautiful point because I was, there's structural leadership and there's leadership. Mm. And you can be, you know, the person on the, the picking floor in a warehouse and the way that you do it and how you do it and even if you do it with a smile on your face, dancing around to some music, but you're still the higher the quality because you're engaged in what you do, that's leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think there's a, a, a big difference between leadership and structural communication. People will listen more to the people that they want to hear from as opposed to the person that they are structurally, structurally have to be attentive to, if I can put it that way. And that can be right throughout the business as well. So the, the very first thing that I'd be doing with a leader is actually getting them to do a self-reflection. Now, whether that's a written thing or whatever, but how do you think you lead? You know, you know if... If you were standing in front of someone who was giving you some frank feedback about your leadership, mm. I think there's a difference between you doing that by yourself and actually hearing it. Um, so if you were doing that and self-reflecting on your leadership style and your leadership capability, what would they say? Because that then challenges you to actually go a little bit inside and sort of, again, put yourself in the respondee's position if that's the right sort of language. Uh, and I'd, I'd be getting them to do that. And, you, and, you know, it's like what we talked about a little bit earlier in the saying that, well, if you're here and you believe you're that style, what does this look like? And it's not a matter of me telling you what it needs to look like. It's, it's for them to actually saying, well, you know, I could be doing, I could, I could look a little bit, take listening. You know, as, as a leader, I don't think I listen as well as I could or I tend to jump in too much. So your progression along a leadership capability says, well, where do you want to be? Just on that point. Well, I might want to you know, count to five a little bit more and actually wait and hear it. So a lot of the leadership stuff that I sort of talk about is sort of getting them to self-reflect and understand then to unpack their own progression and help them and challenge them about, okay, do you really think that's going to make a difference or is that making a difference for you and not for the people you're leading? Sure. And I think there's a big difference with that. And again, not saying that's right or wrong, but if you make a difference to yourself, what are you going to do with it? And you know, trying to draw it back to the people that you're leading. Hmm. Is that positively taken? Uh, yeah, mostly. Yeah. yeah. But because I suppose why I hesitated is, is if they are truly on a commitment on leadership, um, they'll want to hear that. Yeah. They'll want to understand it. They'll want to actually try and address it. Um, it's actually, I hadn't thought about it, but it's probably a good measure that if it isn't received well, you probably then can step back a little bit and question, well, what, you know, again, journey, what journey are you actually on? Mm. Um, and if you're close to something like that, there's probably a greater thing we've got to work on about being a bit more open before you can actually get to where you possibly can get to. And it comes back to your question about techniques and sort of how you might help business. Again, the other thing that I'm probably a little bit passionate about, you know, people talk about best practice. The language I use is better, better practice, mm. kind of like perfection. So what is best practice? If I get here at best practice, where am I going? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, the game's over. <laughs> game's over. So, again, trying to foster what is better mm. and as long as, again, it's like a lot of things. It's like, you know, as soon as we stop learning, we die. But, you know, if you're continually pursuing better, you will no, and no one's telling you that you have to get to this and that's success. Mm. Just the bet, the process, the process of getting better mm. is the success in its own right. It's not a matter of saying, well, unless you hit this target, the definitive end in mind isn't necessarily the outcome. It's the actual learning from the process and getting better. So I, you know, for me personally, talk a little bit more about better practice than best practice. Yeah. Because you, you could have two organisations that are in two different industries and one could be nailing something, to come back to a supply chain example, absolutely nailing their supply chain. Uh, and another organisation might be miles behind where they are, but they've still got a better in them. So even the guys that are nailing supply chains have a better place to be mm. if they want to put some things in place. 
from an overall business perspective, it might not be their priority because they're at a, a great place. But it's not for them to come back and say, well, you know, you should be up here. You know, you don't have to be here to be better. Yeah. You have to be just here to be better. Yeah, you can be better in any anywhere you are on that yeah. on that timeline. Yep. You can always aim to be better. And, and it quite often, <clears throat> you know, the the other thing that I look at with business is get get passionate about the habit of execution, because so many businesses out there start a lot of things and finish very little. Patrick Lezioni, uh, you know, the five dysfunctions of a team, but has a follow up book called The Advantage, and you know, part of the stuff in that is just simply get used to delivering, get used to executing. And whether that's one or two things at any particular point in time, Mm -hmm. but get into the habit of execution because it will get habitual. It will get... um, To finish jobs, you mean? Yeah. 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 And, you know, classically, organisations can go through a strategic process or an innovation process and come up with 20 things that they could be doing and they'll allocate those 20 things to 20 staff members or whatever. And quite often they'll come back in six months or whatever and find out that of that 20, Mm. maybe one or two of them have been completed, four or five of them haven't even started, and the rest are somewhere in the middle. Mm. As opposed to saying, uh, as a collective, we're going to prioritise one or two things to do and we're absolutely going to invest our time and effort into actually delivering the outcomes that we identify from that and we're going to celebrate. And then we're going to do the next thing and we're going to celebrate. We're going to do the next thing and we're going to celebrate. So you start to engender this real process of identify it, understand the impact of it, do it, celebrate it, and then do the next. And you then actually you celebrate the achievement of execution as opposed to we've got all these ideas, let's do something with them. Sure. So that's something that we actually focus on at the end of our strategy session to say, well, what's the one or two things we're really going to do? So that the execution becomes habitual. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. And you mentioned team. How does teamwork play into the overall outcome or success of a, of your clients? And do you do you get them? Is there a process with the, with the the owner or the business people or the management to over time as the business or the venture evolves? Presumably, the team and the, or the, the goals change. The team needs to evolve. How often are you suggesting that they re- take restock of the of the team and the roles that necess- that's needed and how, let's see, what are your views generally of, of teamwork? I think teamwork's essential. Mm. I mean, if we, you know, there's a model out there that a lot of people talk about the Tuckman model, the storming, forming, norming, performing, um, which I do believe is a very good model and sort of a, most teams go through that. If you, if you really want to look at a great model in my opinion, there's a thing out there called Drexler Sibbett, which is a different teaming model, but it's got some beautiful visuals to it, which is mm. fantastic. But I think with the team, it's, the greatest thing that a team offers is joint ownership and joint outcome. So individuals can achieve, most individuals, in my opinion, can't achieve what's possible without the support of somebody, without the support of something. Can't agree more. Can't agree, yeah. So it's it's recognising that achievement and recognising the team around them to allow them to get there. And, you know, if the team can then own the outcome, even if someone in the team, it comes to your comment about leadership before, you know, it could be, the the new intern that Mm. comes in with this completely fresh way of looking stuff because they're doing some real innovative things at university that actually drives the team to an outcome that the art team never thought of because they don't instinctively think that way. Mm. You know, that's leadership for me. Celebrate the outcome, but it's the team that owns it. So, and I do think one of the first things you try and do with teams is understand the different dynamics in the team. We're beautifully all individual. Mm -hmm. And as such, even if we look in similar think the same sort of way, there's going to be a difference. And the question isn't not just finding the difference, it's actually what do we do with it? And respect comes to actually recognising the difference. So give you the example, you know, probably more the simple example is when you do things like Myers-Briggs or 16th personalities or whatever, and you talk about um, extroverts and introverts, and, you know, just a simple permission the team might give an introvert to simply say, if I'm an extrovert, I get energy from the interaction. Mm-hmm. If I'm an introvert, I need to get energy from my own internal thinking. But if classically, if I'm a real high high extrovert, I'll ask you a question. I won't give you the chance. I won't, I won't allow you to give you some time to think about it. I'll be looking for, you know, is there anything I can help? Do, do you understand the question? You know, yeah. Is there anything else I can give you? To, where, you know, quite often in those team dynamics, we actually sell the person who's like that saying, just put your hand up and say, I'm processing. And it's a flag quite often to the team saying, I respect what you've just asked me. Mm. Allow me to actually think through it and 
there because, was the outcome. Because I'm not like you. Yeah. 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 And it's – so with any team that's sort of coming together, sort of spending a little bit of time and understanding the dynamics and who they are in the team and why they're different and – then challenge the team to say, now that we understand those differences, how do we actually get the outcome or the how do we use that to our collective benefit, not only to deliver the process and get to an outcome, but the opportunity for the team to learn purely from the idea that we've accepted or we've identified that you and I are different. And we might have had the similar sort of education, similar sort of upbringing, similar sort of parent, parents, whatever, but we think differently. Mm. How, do, how do we utilise that? Because if you can harness the utilisation of that or the benefit of that, I can guarantee the team's going to be in a better place or mm. an enhanced place. So I think there's a real – putting teams together, it's a matter of really focusing a little bit up front on that personal dynamic and who the people are. Yeah. And there could be people who butt heads and that's okay, providing you've got – you give them an environment where that butting of heads can actually be done constructively. Correct. Uh, so that the outcome is actually going to be owned because you've gone through that – constructive process yeah i think i think a lot of silly in the workplaces where i've been and, and experienced like they sort of <clears throat> hoping that everyone's happy yep and it's like well it's not necessarily the goal it's yep. not a it you know you're going to butt heads yep you're going to and it's not going to be perfect but that's like any relationship right and it, the, the the sooner you accept that and foster as you say an environment where it's constructive and you can constructively butt heads and be better for it i think and and provide a provide a, a place of work or or a, or a relationship where it's it's fulfill you're fulfilled yeah by the by the by being there yeah rather than i just want to be happy you just want everyone to be happy yeah i think fulfillment is more of the goal yeah. For your staff and for your team to be fulfilled, yeah. um, I mean the happiness is a byproduct, but it's not, I don't think I don't believe that's the goal. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. And that you know the, even that constructive butting of heads could almost guarantee you ninety nine times out of a hundred the outcome through that process is going to be at a different level than if I didn't butt heads. Yeah, right. and you know that's the storming aspect of Tuckman, but you know I do think that's a really strong. Um, requirement for good teamwork mm. that the environment invites and allows that to happen. Yeah, it almost supports it, right? Yeah, to be able to say, yeah, if you want to speak your truth and and this is a result butts heads, and that's okay. And yeah. the, the people in your team feel supported in that environment that they're not under threat. Yep, they've got still got security and and it's it's a safe place to be able to butt heads. Yeah, then I think it's going to be a better out a better environment because of that. Yeah, you know, great. and I mean, I'm in this goodness. This business is in its infancy, absolutely. But the first thing I said to my little team was, "We're never, always, we're not always going to agree." Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing because we're not all the same. Yeah, and it's encouraged, and I want them to speak up and hold their two feet on the ground that they believe, and we'll come to a conclusion. But it's a safe place to do that. Absolutely, and it's encouraged because who wants to be in a a, who wants to be in living under a dictatorship, but also B, who wants to be th feel like they can't be true yeah. to their own beliefs yeah. or their own way, their own ideals. Uh, no one wants to work in that. And, and thank you for sharing that because what I also hear there is you're giving them permission to be who they are. Mm. And I think quite often people are res re uh, resistant to put forward an idea because they don't believe they can. Mm. And as a leader demonstrating that that is possible or giving people a really specific permission that says you can say whatever you want because I know that if you do, I'm actually going to be in a better position. The leader, I'm going to be in a, or the team's going to be in a better position for you doing that. Yeah. You have permission. I, you know, I'm, I had a long corporate career with Deloitte, but, you know, we had this incredible CEO called Guillaume Swiggers who I bumped into not too long ago. But him and his partners at the top of the um, – God, this must be God, 15, 16 years ago, came up with an idea where they actually told all the staff across Australia, tell us what the dumb things are. And that's the way they put it. We want to know what the dumb things are we do. And it was almost giving every staff member within Deloitte across the country the permission to tell a partner that you're stupid mm. in a nice sort of sense. Mm. And that just took off because all of a sudden 
um, the frustrations I might have or the silliness that I might see within a corporate the size of that, I could actually tell someone that it's dumb. Yeah. And it was just a really nice example of give someone the permission and watch where they go, mm. whether that's permission to do something proactively or, wish it, or provide some feedback. And I think that is also a factor of leadership that where you, where you are prepared to be vulnerable enough to hear mm. that you're not doing something at the level where you could be or you are doing something stupid or you are stupid's the wrong word, doing something dumb. Mm. So as a leader, you've got to be prepared to actually accept that and do something with it. One of the concerns I have with a lot of businesses where they go in, again, they put a process in place where they ask for feedback. They get the feedback and then they do nothing with it or they do very little with it. And then they wonder why the second time they've asked for feedback, it gets less. And they wonder at the third time is no one's talking, no one's answering the survey questions or whatever. Yeah. You know, hold yourself accountable to A, thank people for the feedback, demonstrate that you've listened to it, and also then clearly demonstrate what you're going to do with it and then do it. Then do it. You know, and, and it doesn't sound like rocket science, but in a lot of businesses, it's very hard for them to do. And one of the reasons why I do believe it's very hard for them to do is they try and do 20 things. Mm. Um, always say thank you, always respect where it's come from and recognise what you're going to do with it and then deliver. And if again, it comes back into that habit of execution, that if you can do that, guess what? The next time you ask for someone's advice or someone's feedback, they're going to give it to you. Yeah. Because you've valued that input. I like that so much. And I think I think you're trying to, by, by asking that question at Deloitte's or by framing it in a way that, giving them even giving your staff permission i think you're accepting who they are as well yep as as the people that they are you're not trying them you're approaching them the approaching the situation that they're all different they'll have all different views and, th and that's okay yep and <clears throat> like i said to my team like you're all different but my goal is to get you as the person that you are to be the best person that you can be yep not to be me or to to uh, me to shape you in a way that you don't want to be shaped, but just who you are and what you bring to this business. I just want you to be the best possible version of that. Yeah. And Fantastic. That's, yeah, that's, that's all you can ask for. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think when you do speak to your clients about goals, let's say the $10 million man, yeah. or let's say that's the top line goal, right? How do you play with this, that speaking of potential, like so often business will go, oh, next year we're going to raise, the goal is to raise 10% up, you know, to be 10%, but get a higher top line of 10% 10, 10 yep. from last year. Shouldn't the goal be we should be trying to extract the very most highest potential of our team Yep. rather than an arbitrary X percentage increase in revenue? Yes and no. Uh, the arbitrary increase in revenue is a measure that's attained is a is more tangible sure um so my question back and i don't disagree with you know allowing the team to to generate or to get to their own their all their outcomes how do you know when you're going to get there how do you know when you're there hmm. i think that's the real good conversation that says well we don't need to be 10 million dollars we'll know when this this and this happens and you know quite often if you can actually get to that definition the 10 million dollars just <laughs> Takes out, care of itself. Takes care of itself. Uh -huh. Or the ten percent increase mm -hmm. just take care of itself. I think it's also interesting that probably not so much with business ownership, particularly if you're playing with the owner. You've also always got to be recognizing that there's other stakeholders that you also need to bring along for the journey. They are the ones that might need the ten percent measure. Because if the stake if they're shareholders or if they're, you know, investors. Uh, investors mm -hmm. or a silent partner. Yeah. Um, you can't tell them <laughs> the goal is just for everyone to do their best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's but again back to your point about teams and and about you know high powered teams and engagement with teams. That if you can have that conversation and imagine everybody saying, well, if I'm here, if we build an environment that allows you to actually get to where you want to be, and that's over here, what's it look like? And I, I do think it's a valid question for people saying, well, how do you measure that? I, I get that, but I, my point is, is like let's say the goal is ten percent. As a leader in any level of the business, what value have you got in going around to your team going, this month, are we 10% up from last year? Yeah. Like it, it loses it, right? People yeah. are like, oh God, what are we doing here? 
Whereas if you're more focused on creating an environment, creating the support, creating the culture of going, I want to create a place where you are at your highest potential. Yep. Then the goal and that shit will take care of itself. Yep. And if it doesn't, then, and you've still extracted the potential, then at least you answer. And I, I get your point in the sense that how do you measure whether someone is at, is at their potential? How do you measure the, where, how the team is at its potential? Yeah. But surely that's a better focus point than just a 10%. Yes, it is. And using that to. And it, if you can't achieve that, the outcome will take care of itself. 100%. Yeah. And if, it, if you're at 9%, then you go, well, that's still our. Uh, I guess as an athlete, you know, I had flirted with this idea of, well, this is the goal, let's say, to win a world championship. Yep. And that's very objective. Yep. <laughs> you either win it or you don't. Um, but ultimately it comes back to the focus for me to go, well, a lot of that's out of my control. If someone who is who has the same luck, I guess, who is technically better and faster than me, yep. no matter what, they're going to beat me. Yep. And I'm going to lose. Yep. But what is in my control is can I extract the very most highest potential as I can as an athlete and the team around me. Yep. And that is in my control. So I'm going to create. The goal might be, well, I, I, I focused it as, or I reframed it in my mind, the target is to win a world championship. Yep. The goal is to create an environment that allows my potential. And that's the focus. Yep. The goal is the focus, which is the environment. Yep. And so as we progress, we go, yeah, we, the target's to win. But what's in our control is to create, make myself the fastest possible version as I can be. Yep. And then let's see. Yeah. And the thing I love hearing quite often with sport is that someone has achieved a personal best. Mm -hmm. They can still come 20th. Yep. But if they've achieved the personal best, what else can you ask them to do? hundred percent. And you find that in swimming actually, which yeah. swimming is drilled. And for anyone listening who's into the kids swimming or swimming generally, it is insane, right? Yeah. Because that is drilled in them from when they're first like five. Yeah. That it's about pers your personal best. Yeah. And you will see at the Olympics that they'll the gold. And you're to your point if they're twentieth, but reversed if they're the gold medalist. Yeah. Yeah, they're on the TV. They're more stoked. At setting a personal That's best, best. Yeah. and getting the gold medal, yeah. although you know they broke a world record, and by virtue, by definition, it's a it's a personal best. Yeah, it's less important that they're the fastest in the world ever, yep. and more important that they've just been in their own time. Yeah, and so I think there's a lot to be said for that. Absolutely, because you talk about um, engendering an environment that allows someone to do that. What's the greatest measure of that environment working? is that if you take swimming squads, for example, that the majority of the squad are continually improving mm. and, and, and getting their personal best. And, you know, I was a swimmer, but, um, you know, if, if, if you are continually doing that, to, it's almost like the $10 million. If you are continually doing that, you'd like to think that your results, for want of a better word, are going to improve in the pool that you're competing in. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to come first. No. What a great outcome if you do, but... If you are continually improving and you're kind of improving more than the other people around you by outcome, mm. you'll you'll you know, you'll get the the blue ribbon or the green ribbon or the, or the ten million dollar revenue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's But know, it's challenging without the without in business, without the in comparison to swimming or sport, without the very clear definitive way to measure improvement. Yep. like you can for swimming. But I guess it's what we're talking about is the process of being the driver of being your highest potential is not in swimming. It's the day to day. It's the goal yep. is the grind, right? The it's the consistent, the yeah, yeah. It's the consistency that at one, at one that you're, you're you, it's a, it's a question of when, not if yep. you'll achieve what you're setting out to achieve. So how, if that, if we, if we believe that, if we stack that up on itself and go, yeah, that's what that's what high performance or success looks like and to achieve a, an ultimate goal, how do we bring that into business where it's not as clear cut what potential looks like? I, I think what comes to mind is that, you know, come back to our $10 million revenue, you can get to $10 million revenue and still have a very unhealthy business. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of actually unpacking what are some of those measures 
or some of those factors where you should be tracking. You know, and if you've got an engaged team progressing, their engagement should be high. So there's a ma- measure. Mm. Um, working capital in business, as you'll probably end up finding out <laughs> as you start to get into business, you know, is incredibly important. So, you know, I'd rather... I'm already there. I already know how important that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, is what we're doing and the way we're doing things, making sure that we're getting the money in that we need and actually paying the money out to keep the suppliers happy. Um, so, therefore, the working capital is under control. Mm. Is it, if I'm in a professional services business, which you're about to get into, you know, for want of a better word, is is utilisation under control, that I'm keeping my staff not just busy, but they're actually engaged in the work that they want to be engaged in or they're doing the opportunity of the work that they're doing. So therefore their engagement will be high and guess what? Their production will be higher because mm. of who they are and they're actually engaged in what they want to do. Yeah. So, you know, to, to your point before, the ultimate outcome, measurable outcome, might be the, the 10 million. But come back and understand the factors that can, you can track to know whether we're going to achieve that. But more importantly, what we're going to achieve is an environment that says that's not only possible, we could be over here, we mm. can be over, over here. Um, so it's actually defining, you know, it's breaking those measures down and they all don't have to be that tangible. You know, imagine if you walked into a, a business environment every morning as running the business and you're just, again, one of, the, one of the nice little tools that we've used before is like a speedometer. But it was basically you put up a, a big poster that has a speedometer on it, zero to ten. Right. And underneath it, you've got two questions that says things we must keep doing and things we can improve on. And generally, there's two posters side by side. And basically, one is about the way we do things and the what we do. And you, at any point in time, you can ask your staff, give me a rating out of 10 mm. as to the way we're doing things or what we're doing. But don't be prepared to put a rating up there unless you're prepared to either put both or one of the things down the bottom. So it's instantaneous feedback. It's no survey orientated. It's on a big post-it note um, and people can build on the others of what other people have put and actually all of a sudden in a very five or ten minute exercise, you've got this, uh, you know, uh, you've taken a, a litmus test of where you're currently at. You've got a good visual, and I love visuals, you've got mm. a good visual of whether I'm at ten or whether I'm at three um, and you're given some immediate feedback. And that's not a um, tangible measure in, in utilisation percentage or time but in an environment like we are here or an environment that I've worked with, put that up on the wall and almost once a week, give me a rating. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's again, it's empowering staff and giving them permission to give me whatever rating you want. Mm. And if you give me a three, I'm not going to come and jump down your throat. I'm going to be asking why. Mm. And I want to move that three to a four to a five to a six. Sure. Tell me how. Yeah. So to your point, I mean, that's probably more of, an, more of a measure on the environment that you're asking me to work in and develop in as opposed to whether I'm 9 million, 10 million, 11 million. Yeah. Because if I'm always pushing the 10s and I'm doing the things that actually will get me to the outcome, like, as you said, the 10 million will take it, take care of itself. Mm. Some people have clear goals, but not necessarily contingent. It's not that necessarily paints the whole picture. So they might say, yeah, yeah, I want, I want to get $10 million as the top line revenue. And you go, well, as well as what? Because... They want to do that. Yeah. But they probably also want to stay married. Yeah. And they still want to have a good relationship with their children. Yeah. And they still want to have their team. Yeah. Highly engaged. And they, so there's a lot of a lot of ands than just the one big goal for business. Yeah. Um, and so it's how the how the other things that's that that are critically important in their lives intertwine with that goal, right? Yeah. One of the other words I love is buoyancy. Because people, you know, wrong or right or wrong, people talk about sustainability or resilience or whatever. I love buoyancy. Mm-hmm. And what occurs to me with that sharing, so thank you for that, is that I can be buoyant, therefore I can respond quickly or I can, you know, respond to anything that's coming at me because of the environment around me. That if I do have a good relationship, hopefully, with my children and I have a, you know, a bad day at work and I need to respond to that, I might come in and actually play a game with my kids and sort of get them to read a story to me or I have a great relationship with my partner where I can actually come and share anything. You know, it's those things that are around me that will allow me to be buoyant and either be above the rough water or if I'm below it, I can respond back. Mm-hmm. So, and it, and it might be that 
the pressure I'm under is because of the work or the banks or tax or whatever. But if I'm in a healthy environment, this all comes right back to my owner maps. If I'm in a healthy environment, I understand all of that. I can respond. I can get above it. And quite often, as we just talked about, I'm not going to get above it just purely because of me. I'm going to get around. I'm going to get above it because of the people around me. Because of my team. Because of my team. Yeah. And my team can be my kids. Yep. You know, and you know the the the, court, the one I'm doing on Sunday um, was you know one of the one of the comments that came out of that is my child is about to just leave school and they're about to go mm. and I don't know them. Oh. You know and. I think there's a lot of owners in that sort of boat that sort of says, well, and again, the classic thing is you can't change anything that's happened in the past. Mm. But what learning can you pull from that that changes things you're about to do in the future? And it's not just about that component. It's about all this stuff. You know, what? even if you can recognise that's one component that I've got to deal with, what are all the other components in your environment that you're maybe blind to but they are a very similar character? And whether that's with your partner, whether that's with your parents, that you know, dangerous assumption, they're all going, always going to be there. They're not. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's you know, again, it comes back to a little bit of like vulnerability, being vulnerable to actually recognise that you're not on top of that. And that at some point in time, for you to be successful in business, you've got to get on top of that because if you're not on top of that, whether it's sustainability, resilience or buoyancy, you're not going to actually be able to do everything that you want yeah. in, the, in the level that you want. So it's almost like a prerequisite. It is, and it, and it's um, and I think you know if you can have the conversation yourself with your partner, or whatever about what's important to you and why you're in business, and then take and I haven't done this with anybody now that I think about it. If you then take it to the next step and say, have you shared that with your management team, your leadership team, that you've put yourself through this exercise, and that you could almost challenge them to go through the same exercise? Imagine what that business starts to look like. Mm. We have got. The people who are, you know, have the responsibility of sort of growing that environment that you talk about and growing the business are all now more attuned to why and more attuned to the balances that are around them. Imagine the power that's in that. Yeah. And I actually hadn't ever thought about saying to any of those people that I've done this map for and saying, well, have you told anybody? Mm. There's value there. <laughs> oh, there is. Yeah. Like, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's empowering. Yeah. Vulnerable. It's vulnerability. Yeah, First key. of all, saying that I realized I had to do it. Yes. And this is what the process was and this was the outcome. Yeah. I think vulnerability is incredibly powerful. Alan, this has been such a delight. Now, before I let you go, yep. there are five quick questions I've got for you. Oh, cool. Okay. Which, which I haven't actually <laughs> – sometimes I send them and sometimes I, I don't. But I can guarantee you, folks, he hasn't sent them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so – the first one is the number one tip that you would give someone looking to be more successful in their life. Empathetic, clearly. Provide, be more empathetic. Um, be prepared to be empathetic by understanding the people that you're dealing with. Beautiful. Dealing with, in dealing is probably the wrong word, but engaging with mm. customers, staff, whoever. Oh. Put yourself in their shoes and that, as I said, that tool might help them do that. Number one tip for someone looking to be happier in their life. Be prepared to be comfortable within space. So what I mean by that is space can be just yourself and be prepared to be part of who you are. Just be comfortable with yourself. Or whether it's you know offering enough time to listen to someone well. Um, I think giving yourself space is such an important thing in your own development and own success because with space comes thinking. Mm. With space comes time to respond. Um, if I can do very, very quickly, one of the most challenging things that ever happened to me, uh, and I'm still dealing with it, to be honest, I've got four beautiful, beautiful kids and, and two now with my wonderful partner, Nat. not mine, but, um, you know, allowed, they're now in my life. But my four kids, Ben, Jacob, Olivia and Chloe, I was had the incredible opportunity to take Chloe or, or go with Chloe to, a, to, to the US. She was on a two-week design school exercise with QUT. The very last Sunday we were in, in Central Park and Chloe and I were supposed to have breakfast. I've never told her this. Sorry, Chloe. Um, and all her friends started to come up, turn up from the uni because we went over there two or three weeks before the, the education two weeks. And she sort of said, Dad, you know, 
friends are already here. Uh, do you mind if we don't do breakfast? This is the last day. I don't, don't do breakfast and I'm going to catch up with my kids. Obviously, you say, yeah, that's all right. You know, great. You know. while, you, while you sub off. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough. <laughs> yeah. So I then went to the airport, sort of it was, um, you know, a, a layover somewhere and I found myself literally on the flight back to Australia half sobbing in, in all honesty, saying, all due respect, what the fuck do I do now? Here's my youngest child, 21. Um, I've just handed her over to people I don't really know in what is supposedly one of the biggest cities in the world being New York and all my other kids are on their way and they're fantastic and all of a sudden I'm, I'm back in a plane sitting by myself going and I'm still dealing with that to be honest and that's you know she's now 26 so that's five years ago and when I you know the relationship to space is that all through that journey of my kids uh, and my advice to anybody in a parent is all through that journey, still find time for space, still find time for you, still find time for you and your, your partner, unselfishly. Because at some point in time, you are going to be back into an environment where it's just you. Where you're forced. Where you're forced to. Have space. Absolutely. And oh, it was such a profound, hard thing for me to do. As I came back, I'm getting teary. I came back from that in my little cottage at Albion that I rent, and you're walking through the house going... <laughs> What do I do? And the learning I took from that is, and I can't change the past, but if, if I was then able to tap into some more time for me and have, and this is actually the correlation for me with a lot of businesses, and quite often when we work with businesses in generations, the second generation or third generation comes to you and say, can you please just help me get dad to let go or let mum to let go? And quite often they struggle to let go because they've got nothing else. And that is their life. That is their baby. That is what they've been doing. So where space comes into that is, you know, if you're a first generation owner of a business handing over to your siblings, having, you know, what's the, where have they fostered something else mm -hmm. that they are willing to let go of this because they got that? Mm -hmm. And for me with Chloe, it's a matter of not being prepared for what then happened. And so saying, well, you know, all these, you've got to let them go. But... What's over here? Yeah. So, so that's a long answer to No, I to really space. appreciate that response and that vulnerability, oh, Alan. And it sounds, sounds like that it was almost like that crucible moment, like the Band-Aid rip yep. and that you just weren't ready for. Yep. And still dealing with yep. the fact, not necessarily the reality, but still dealing with the maybe the trauma or the feeling that you had at that point in time on that plane. And coming back to Brisbane, yep, because you weren't ready for it, yep, yeah, yep. And it was, I suppose, in my environment where you're sort of trying to give answers to everybody else. All of a sudden, I've been forced with something where I don't have an answer for I myself. Don't have an answer, yeah. And you sort of think, and then the learning is, which I didn't offer myself that at that point, particular point in time, is it's okay. Mm. It's okay to sit in this, um, you know, to a certain degree vulnerable, but sitting and sit in this uncertainty, yeah. And, and embrace the uncertainty, then ask yourself the question, what comes with this uncertainty? What's mm. the opportunity that I haven't seen yet mm. or haven't even thought about it in that respect because I've now been offered this space to allow myself to actually really think about what else I can do with it? Yeah, I think, I think a general response of, and that's okay, is pretty fitting to any circumstance or to, very, to, to the vast majority of circumstances in life yeah to say and that's okay yep someone's quit yep that's, that's okay. okay someone's told me it gives you it, it maybe that it, it, in, it invites that pause yeah to go all right the five seconds yep to go that's okay yep now what we're going to do about it yep. uh third question was is uh your most recommended or gifted book to, oh. for someone to read yep uh, the last lecture by uh, randy Pausch. Okay. Uh, above everything else. Really? Absolutely. Okay. So if you don't know what the story is, that Randy um, very quickly was a professor at Carnie Mallow in the States. This is nonfiction, obviously. Nonfiction, yeah. true story. And you can, and my great advice is you can watch the last lecture online, read the book first. Mm -hmm. So Randy's passed on. So he was, I can't quite, he was diagnosed with cancer. I can't quite remember which one it was. But he... 
uh, was one of the fittest people you could see. And even in the, the last lecture that you'll see on stage is he's down doing push-ups and whatever. Right. But he's up front of saying, you know, I won't be here in X amount of time. And he wrote a book called The Last Lecture and Don't Ever Lose Sight of Your Boyhood Dreams was the byline. And it's, it's you know, not a hard book to read, but there's so many stories and messages and whatever in it. It's just, it is my go-to book that I give people. Okay. And I've probably given six or seven out just yeah, to say, sure. just read this. Yeah. So, the last, the last lecture. Uh, the most influential person in your life? That's an interesting question. <laughs> Actually, finally, my first response was my dog. <laughs> 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 it's a great answer. Oh, it's interesting because it grounds you. It does, and you know, um, you know, dogs do so many things that, um, like for example, what's the first thing that a dog does when they wake up in the morning is they stretch. Mm. Before you take them for the walk, what do they do? They stretch. Yeah, and they go and get a drink of water, mm -hmm. and you sort of go, hmm. hmm. <laughs> <laughs> something that's, on that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. good advice. Um, certainly, your partner Nat at the moment is. Um, you know, she is a business owner in her own right. She's a fantastic person and, you know, I'm her sounding board and it's an interesting reminder of me that I don't have to have a solution. Mm. Um, the greatest thing that I can offer her at the moment and some of the challenges she's got with her work and some of the opportunities, not all challenge, is just to listen. Yeah. Uh, and know that she, sorry, Nat is comfortable in sharing and knowing that she's respected in what she shares and just simply listening. And it's one of the greatest, I suppose, reminders of what I can be for others just by simply listening and offering advice when you can or what, when you're asked for. But, yeah. Love that. Yeah. And then finally, uh, a guest, famous or not, you think would be good for us to interview or to, to get onto the show? <laughs> um, one of the guys that I've had the fortune to meet uh, was a guy called Andrew Locke. Um, and I probably don't know him well enough to say come and do this, but Andrew is Australia's most former mountaineer. Okay. Um, and I don't know whether he's the only Australian or one of the Australians who actually have climbed all 8,000 8, peaks. Um, but why I say Andrew is, you know, it, and it's a really interesting, um, you know, people are so, and, and same with me, are so... Um, connected to Everest and want to know the Everest story, the Everest story. Mm. It's interesting when you hear Andrew talk, um, he talks about some of the other 8,000 peaks and some of them are far more challenging than Everest. And, you know, it always blows my mind that he has turned around uh, climbers that he was climbing with 100 metres from the top of the mountain. And you sort of go, <laughs> how did you do that? How did you achieve that? And obviously you did it for risk reasons and sure. safety reasons or whatever, but you think about everything we've talked about to, you know, build up your capability to be able to climb the biggest mountain in the world and then 100 metres from the top and no doubt you can see it, someone's convinced you to turn around. Mm. You know, and him having the power, not the power, having the... the um, leadership. The leadership and the process and the environment to convince someone that that's the best thing that they can do. And I think he's done it twice, don't quite me. I know sure. he's done it once. All right. But 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 the second tallest, not K2, or Changamanga or something yeah. like that, is one of the hardest mountains to climb. And I said to him one day, I said, look, you know, it's all well and good to know about Everest. I actually want to know about the ones where they were more risky and mm. what you did to actually do that versus Everest. Um, and, you know, paying – I got him to speak at a, at a conference – and, you know, I mean, most, I don't know, you've, you've spoken, I haven't, but, you know, I can imagine that some of the speakers turn up an hour before they've got to be there and do their speech and then leave. I was, I was amazed that Andrew came and spent the whole day, the day before he was supposed to talk, with the conference just purely to understand the people, understand what was being talked about. Yeah, wow. So that he could then take all his experience, and he's an incredible underachiever because he's also done the South Pole. Um, you know, he can take all his experience and then apply it to what the lessons were that he could offer those that organisation. So he'd be, he'd be one. Alan Scott, this has been such a delight and I really, really enjoyed it. I appreciate the opportunity. And um, we'll put the details of, of osmosis in the in the show notes Thank and, you. and link it all so if anyone who's in business um, wants to reach out, they will. But you're 
Oh, you've been highly recommended and I can understand why now because, yeah, you're a wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you very, very much. I Cheers appreciate up. it. No worries. That was another episode of the Success Times Happiness podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and please let your local small business owner know all about the show. Till next time, peace. Thank you.